evening to you. Thank you for making the effort to come out on a Tuesday night, and uh, may the Lord bless you for uh, seeking to honor him and his word. Uh, as we were singing just now on uh, how the Lord Jesus unites his people, uh, what, a, what a glorious thing. Have you ever been to another part of the country or another part of the world, and you have run across another believer in Jesus Christ? You may not even be able to speak their language, particularly in another country, but there's an instant bond because of the Lord Jesus. He is the one who unites us from all cultures and all backgrounds because he is the Lord and uh, we, have, uh, we have come to receive him as Lord and Savior. And what we are doing in this conference time over these several days is we are encountering Jesus We've learned many things about him. We have, uh, we have certainly had much, he's had much impact and influence in our lives. Well, tonight we are going to encounter him yet again. Last night we looked at Jesus and the powerless disciples. Well, tonight we are going to look at Jesus and the dead man. This is a fun encounter with the Lord Jesus. I'd invite you to take your Bible and go to the gospel according to John chapter 11 tonight. John 11. Now my text tonight, please take a moment to catch your collective breath, is 44 verses long. And lest, lest you be fearful, if I only spend one minute on each verse, you already see how long we will be here but I am going to have to tell part of the story. I will read all of it throughout our message tonight, but um, I cannot dwell on everything I would like to, or perhaps everything you would like to, as I seek to get to the heart of this encounter. And I believe the heart of the encounter is found in the middle in verse 25 and 26. I want to begin by reading there and then keep your Bible open because we will read throughout the message tonight. But John 11, 20, uh, 25 begins this way. Jesus said to her, the her is a woman named Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Do you believe this? The more you encounter Jesus, the less you fear death. Mm -hmm. If we have learned anything as a nation in recent years, it's we are terrified of dying. In fact, we will adopt whatever is necessary to distance ourselves from death. Now, I, I certainly believe that the desire to avoid death at all costs is a grace that has been given to us by God. We don't seek death. What about all the hysteria and the consuming dread of dying that seems to dominate those of us in this nation? But I say again from the scripture that the more you encounter Jesus, the less you fear death. Christians are truly the ultimate realists. We do not seek death, nor do we idolize death, but we face the certainty of death. And more importantly, we overthrow the tyranny of death through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Death is real. But we, the Christian, we are not afraid of it. For we are told in 1 Corinthians 15 that death, because of Christ, has been swallowed up in victory. Where is your sting, O death? Where is your victory, O grave? No, it is Christ Jesus who has given us the victory through his death and resurrection. In fact, for the Christian, for the believer, death has become for us only the cold shadow we must pass through in order to be with our Lord and Savior. Now, truly, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and following, we, we, we do discover and, and know that we do mourn and we cry and we grieve over the death of our loved ones who have died before us in Christ. But we do not sorrow as those without hope. Because of Jesus Christ alone, in the face of death, our tears are but temporary. They are but liquid hope 
Because we know and believe that those who are in Christ will rise again. Jesus is the resurrection and the life for all who believe. I'll say that again because that is the heart of the encounter in John 11. Jesus is the resurrection and the life for all who believe. And I ask you what the Lord Jesus asked Martha. Do you believe this? I say to you that nothing could be more important for you to believe. But this is no blind faith. We actually have concrete evidence that Jesus himself is the resurrection and the life. Here in John 11, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Spoiler alert. But the raising of him from the dead is the last and the greatest of Jesus' miracles recorded in the Gospel of John. It is the seventh of seven signs that prove this inevitable conclusion. Jesus is God. To not believe that he is God is to willfully spurn all the data and all the evidence. Only those who are determined to reject would not believe what is so clear. This man raises the dead. How could he not be God? So as we go through this encounter with Jesus in John 11, I want us to examine four dramatic moments over four highly emotional days that matter to us on this day. And here are the four moments. Lazarus dies. Then Jesus arrives. Oh, and then Jesus weeps. And finally, he raises a dead man to life again. So those are the four moments. Let us look at each one. Number one, we see that Lazarus dies. Now, here's where I'm going to start reading. I'm going to read 16 verses. I realize that's a lot, but follow along in your scripture. This is the most important thing we could do tonight. A verse, yeah. verse number one. John 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Ah, oh, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he, Jesus, abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and go thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Well, then said the disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he'll do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. And then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. And then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, that means a twin, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. We'll stop our reading there. We read here in these 16 verses that Lazarus dies, which really begs two questions. Who is Lazarus, and why does he die? The first, the first question is easy to answer. The second one, not so much. Let's answer the easy one first. Who is Lazarus? Well, we see that he is a follower of Jesus. Along with his two sisters, Martha and Mary, he is a true believer in Christ. He is someone that Jesus loves. In fact, in verse 3, Jesus loves him as a brother, a phileo, a brother love. 
In verse number five, Jesus loves Lazarus and his sisters with an even deeper intimacy, an agape love, there that word is. Uh, he is devoted to them in love. And then in verse number 11, Jesus and the 12 know Lazarus as a familiar friend and companion. So it is safe to say everybody knows Lazarus loves Jesus and Jesus loves Lazarus. And yet Lazarus becomes gravely ill. Which tells us this, believers in Jesus are not exempt from viruses. Lovers of the Lord Jesus are not exempt from cancers and disease and physical afflictions, nor are we exempt from crippling doubts in God when our bodies are under attack. Have you been there? Oh, but in the darkness and in our afflictions, we cling to this stabilizing truth. Jesus loves me, and he will do right by me. Did you know that's what the, that the sisters did? They appealed to the love of Jesus for a sick Lazarus. There in verse number three, they reach out to him and they say, Lord, the one you love is ill. See, they don't know if it's Jesus' will to heal or not. They don't know what Jesus might do. So all they do is they appeal to his love in the illness. Do not forget your love as you think about Lazarus, Lord. Whatever you choose to do, do it out of love. Relief may or may not come in this life, but we know that God's love cannot change. We are persuaded with the apostle. We are convinced, we are resolved that neither present tribulations nor future distresses have the power to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a stabilizing truth in the sickness and the afflictions. My God loves me and will do right by me. So if it is clear that Jesus loves Lazarus, that comes us up to the second question. If he is so loving, why does he do nothing to stop the sickness and the disease? That's what a lot of non-believers ask Christians all the time. If God is so loving, why does he do nothing? This is not a new question that's come up. And beyond that, why does Jesus delay at the very moment his loved ones need him the most? These are hard questions, but these are legitimate questions to ask. And may I say, though they are hard questions, the answers we at first might not like. Now, we're not always given answers why God does what he does, but when we are told answers to why God allows certain suffering, Will you still trust him, even if at first it doesn't match up with your desires? You see, we, we come to this question, why does Lazarus die? We don't have to scratch our head. Jesus tells us why Lazarus is going to die. In fact, he gives two reasons why. And I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to confess to you right now, I don't like the reasons. They're hard. But Jesus tells us. The, I'll tell you what they two are. Here's why Lazarus dies. So God will be glorified. And the second reason, so our faith or the faith of his people will be strengthened. Now, I'm not making it up. Look at verse number four. When Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God in order that the Son of God himself might be glorified by it. Now, at first glance, when Jesus says, this sickness is not unto death, at first it appears he's lying to them because Lazarus dies. Or we might say, well, no, Jesus isn't lying. He's just trying to soften the blow to a grieving Martha and Mary who has sent some messenger to, to him in some misguided attempt to comfort them. But we reject that out of hand because Jesus is never deceitful. Nor does he lie. Nor is Jesus even speaking about the immediate outcome of the sickness, which in fact will be death. Jesus is talking about the ultimate outcome of this sickness, which will be glory. Now, we've seen the whole story. We know what happens. Here is, in effect, what Jesus is saying to his disciples. Lazarus is sick, 
He will die. I will raise him up and you and others will glorify me. That's why Lazarus is sick and dying. These afflictions and death are not actually about Lazarus, but about me. Wow, that's not easy. Now, I want to say this as an, a brief moment of application. We are not Lazarus, nor do I presume to know the reasons why there is suffering in your life or in my life or in the lives of those of whom we love. However, have you come to the point, Do you? could you ever view your suffering as a mighty launching pad for the glory of God? As we talk about your, your sicknesses and, and, and your afflictions and your darkness, can you see it as something given to you for Christ? Could it be, could it be that the sufferings in our life come at times because not enough people in our community know about how awesome our God is? And God has given us an opportunity to raise awareness of him and his goodness. Here's another question to wrestle through. It is a good desire to be relieved of affliction. But my question is, do you ever come to the point where you desire God to be glorified through your affliction more than your good desire to be relieved of the affliction? Jesus says he is sick because I will be glorified through it. By the way, that answers, I believe, the question of why Jesus delays two days after hearing about the illness. It's not an act of cruelty. Remember, he is devoted, verse 5, to them in love. So everything he does must be interpreted as an act of love for them. So why does Jesus delay? Well, among other things, the longer he waits, the greater the impact of the miracle, and therefore the greater the awareness of who Jesus is. His brilliance and glory dazzle like a diamond against the black cloth of death. So why does Lazarus die? So God will look good. But that's not the only reason. In verses 14 and 15, we find out, secondly, Lazarus dies so that faith will be strengthened. Faith in God. Look at verse 14. Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad. Do you notice those words? I am glad. Why? I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to heal him. For this purpose, you may believe. Now let's go. So we focus in on the 12, much like us, when they hear Jesus say, this sickness is not in the death, way back in verse number four, they misinterpret Jesus. They're like, whoo, Lazarus isn't going to die. So then when Jesus says, let's go to Judea, they say, time out, Lord. The last time we were in that region, uh, the, the, the unbelieving Jews in John 10, 31, tried to stone you for calling yourself God. So if Lazarus isn't going to die, why go and die yourself? Let him sleep. Let him get better. Jesus had to be very clear. and He then tells a parable. and I won't get into it all, but he talks about in the, in the day, there are 12 hours for work and there's 12 hours of non-work. And those who walk in the light will not stumble. And here's basically the idea of the parable. Jesus says, just as the hours of the day are fixed, so is my time on earth. If I stay here, it will not increase my time on this earth. If I go there, it will not decrease my time on this earth. I am under the sovereign hand of my father. But we are going to the town of Bethany so I may raise Lazarus from the dead. And I am glad he has died so you will believe in me. You see, had Jesus been present with Lazarus, a miracle of healing would have been expected. But now a resurrection will have greater impact. Could it be? I don't know. But could it be as we think about our own lives, God allows tensions and troubles in our lives and marriages and families and work because our faith in him still needs further growth and further strengthening? Again, I don't have access to the mind of God other than what he has revealed in the scripture 
But could it not be that others must grow in their own trusting of God? Remember, nothing that happens to you falls out of his love and devotion to you if you belong to him. He brings us to places where we might trust in him and grow our faith. Much like we learned last night from the Father, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. There needs to be a strengthening, and sometimes God brings sicknesses and afflictions in our lives so that we might grow in our trust of him. And thus, ultimately, he is glorified further. So Lazarus dies, and it's not an easy reason why. But Lazarus dies, which leads us to the second moment, and that is Jesus arrives as the resurrection and the life. The harsh realities of life are met by the glorious reality of Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm going to read some more verses now. Verses 17 through 27. Look at this. Then when Jesus came, he found that he, Lazarus, has had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off, and many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. We'll stop our reading there. So dead Lazarus, we are told, has been in the tomb for four days. So apparently here is the timeline. Day number one, the messenger arrived to Jesus. Lazarus is severely ill, and evidently Lazarus dies on day one. That's how sick he was. Days two and three, Jesus and the twelve stay put. Day four... Jesus and the 12 travel to Bethany from where they were located. It is now no question Lazarus is dead and Martha, the older sister, meets Jesus. And she says, Lord, if you had been here, I know my brother would not have died. I think from the timeline, it's pretty clear she is not scolding Jesus. I believe she's expressing regret. He had not the time to get there. If you had been here, you would have healed him, but obviously you weren't able to come. But in her grief, she voices her faith in Jesus. Did you notice what she says? In effect, she says, I am confident that whatever you ask your father to do, he will do in this death. I am confident that through your prayers, Jesus, something good is going to come out of the death of my brother. I don't believe she's speaking of the resurrection on that day, but she is believing God will bring good from the evil. What faith? that Martha has in the Lord Jesus. And then Jesus says, well, Martha, your brother will rise again. And she says, I know he will rise again at the resurrection at the last days. And by the way, Martha is not wrong. For Psalm 73 and Isaiah 26 and Daniel 12 all speak about how the righteous will live again after they die. Martha would have been aware of the teaching of the Lord Jesus in John 5, verses 28 and 29, where Jesus says, all who are in the graves will hear my voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So Martha is not wrong. God will raise Lazarus at the end of days. But she is confronted that day with new truth that blew her mind. And it is to blow our mind too. The new truth is this. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. The resurrection she is talking of is actually standing before her now. In effect, Martha is saying, Lord, I know you have the ability and the authority to raise Lazarus 
on that day, the end of days. Jesus says, Martha, I have the ability and the authority to raise Lazarus on this day. I am the resurrection and the life. With Jesus, your resurrection is guaranteed. The dead in Christ shall live again. This is the truth that removes despair when we are grieving over the death of a loved one. This is the truth that quiets our heart and mind when we face our own death as believers. And I love these, this I am statement of the Lord Jesus. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live again and will never die again. Do you notice how those statements work together? In effect, Jesus says this, I am the resurrection, thus you will live again. And I am the life, thus you will never die again. They go together. And then the searching question to the heart of Martha, do you believe this? And her response is as powerful a confession as the Apostle Peter once had. For she says, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of, the, the Son of God who has come into the world. And my friend, is this your testimony of faith? Is your confession of Jesus the same as Martha's? Are you convinced that Jesus Christ is God sent in the flesh? Have you received him as your only Lord and mighty Savior? If so, then you will live again and you will never, no, never die again. My nan passed away in January of 2017. She was in her early 90s. And her son, my father, asked me to read the scripture at her funeral. And I made a decision I would come later to regret. And that was, I would not look over the passage of scripture before I got up and read it before everybody. And so the passage that was chosen for me were the first 20 verses of John 14. And that's the teaching of the Lord Jesus in the upper room. And so I got up on the day of my man's funeral and I invited the people to turn to John 14. And I stood above the open casket of my grandmother, her lifeless body. And I began to read John 14. I don't know how many times I've read John 14. And I was doing really great until I got to verse 19. And that's when the tears began to start flooding out. For Jesus says in John 14, 19, yet a little while and the world sees me no more, but you see me because I live, you will live also. Oh, the tears burst forth. As I realized, my grandmother is more alive than I am right now. For she is in the presence of the resurrection and the life. I will see her again. Not because she was a good woman. Although compared to others, she was a good woman. Because she had placed her faith in Jesus. And so have I. Because Jesus lives. My grandmother is living now. More alive that this moment than she ever was on this earth. And I don't know your own life journey, but maybe you stay, sit here and say, Andy, I'm glad you can pretend that all is well in your fantasy world. You know, I live in the real world. Well, to that I say, I live in the very same world you do, but I choose to believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Mm -hmm. He is the one who gives me peace. He is the one who gives me hope and joy and purpose and, and, and comfort in the grief and the brokenness of this life. And I ask, what do you have? Where do you go for lasting rest of heart and mind? I believe that I will live again after I die because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. I've received him, have you? Jesus arrives as the resurrection and the life. Let's look at the third and fourth moment. The third one is this. Jesus weeps. Let's read again. I'll pick up in verse 28 and I'll read to verse 37. 
And when she, Martha, had so said or confessed Christ as Lord and Savior, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly saying, The master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now, Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, she goes to the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus, therefore, saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? And they said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. And then said the Jews, behold, how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? On this highly emotional day, it is no is no is not surprising that Mary and Martha and the multitudes of the Jews who were there were weeping. But what strikes our attention every time is that Jesus is weeping. But they are weeping for two different reasons. While they are weeping because Lazarus is dead, Jesus is weeping because they are weeping. He is weeping for they are crying. If you look at verse 33, there are two terms there. It says that he groaned and he was troubled. These two terms are closely related. I'll try to pull them apart. But here it is when it says that Jesus groaned in his spirit. It means that his spirit was so disturbed to the point of indignation. The, the root of this Greek word is to snort in anger. Like a horse that is angry at something. So when it says that Jesus groaned in his spirit, it means there was some anger in Jesus that day. What was his anger over? It angered him that they were weeping. It grieved him that they were suffering. I believe also there was some measure of anger in his own heart over death as the fallout of sin in this world, it deeply moved him that they were hurting and that they had to go through the, the, the sufferings of death and the afflictions of this life. This was not how it was supposed to be. And then it says he was troubled and greatly troubled. Here are raw emotions. Tears are welling up. Jesus is strongly reacting to their heartbreak and their heartache. And so he asks him a question. Where have you buried him? Now, is this question for his information? I highly doubt that. Being the Lord with the knowledge I think he knew where Lazarus was. I believe this question was directed for their benefit. In effect, he is saying to them, take me to where you're hurting. Show me the place of your pain. So they say, Lord, come and see. In effect, Lord, let us show you what hurts. Can we point out to you our pain? Can we show you where our anguish is? And it's at this moment that Jesus weeps. Loud sobs and noisy wailing all around, but he silently bursts into tears like a river overflowing its banks. The tears pour out of his eyes and they stain his face. And there he stands. Can you see him? The man of sorrows. And acquainted with all of our griefs. One of the most human moments in the life of our Lord. So in your mind's eye, look at his eyes. See how red they are. Listen to his crying. Hear him take a convulsing sigh. And know that Jesus is deeply moved. By how much suffering you have to go through. And like these people. Take him to the source of your suffering. Show him your loss. Lord Jesus. This is what hurts. I don't like this. 
This is the pain in my life. This is the affliction. This is why I'm crying at night. This is what grieves my soul. And know that Jesus is deeply touched. He is greatly moved. Are you churning inside with grief? Do you toss and turn some nights with little sleep? So many different reasons broken over a child or grandchild over their sinful life choices. Torn or betrayed by a trusted friend or spouse or our ex-spouse. Slandered, maligned. Tied up in knots over the financial insecurity of your family. Crushed over the death of a loved one and the loneliness just rips at your heart. Or maybe even just guilt over your own hypocrisy and repeated failure in God's sight. Whatever the pain, whatever the turmoil, whatever the loss, Jesus is grieved that you are suffering. And he's angry that you have to suffer. He's angry what's happened to his world. And that's why he came. I read in Psalm 56, verses 8 and 9, the psalm writer says that the Lord has kept count of his tossings. And he collects his tears in a bottle. And then he says, are they not written in your book? My enemies will turn back in those days when I call. This I know, for God is for me. May I say this? Not a tear you shed is misplaced or disregarded. Not only, it's a metaphor, but not only does God, as it were, collect all of your tears in a sacred bottle, it's also written down in a book. I like to think of it this way. God journals your tears. He knows every tear that falls. There's no need for despair if you have Jesus, for he is acquainted with your grief. He has experienced the depth of your sorrow and the cause of your sorrow upon the cross of Calvary. He is the healer of your broken heart. Jesus weeps. But again, he has come to do something about the afflictions and pains and ultimately the sin. Of our heart and lives. For the fourth and final dramatic moment over these four emotional days is that Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Let's pick up in verse 38 and read to verse 44. Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, comes to the grave. It was a cave, a stone lay upon it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinks. He hath been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, and this is hearkening back to his earlier conversation. Said I not unto thee that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father... I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I know that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I say it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, his face was bound about with, about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him. Let him go. Wow. They remove the stone from the cave and Jesus prays. <laughs> and it's not a prayer asking the Father to do anything. It's a prayer of thanksgiving for what Jesus is about to do. And what the Father is about to do through the Son. We are reminded again, this whole emotional and dramatic tragedy is entirely and exclusively for Jesus to be glorified in the minds of everybody else that they may believe that he is God. Then he says these three words, Lazarus, come forth. 
Now, a couple things about that. Number one, notice he says it with a loud voice. He shouts the command. Hear the voice of authority. Lazarus, come forth. I don't think this is a true story that I'm about to tell you. This is certainly in John. But the story I'm about to tell you, I don't think it actually happened, but it, it's fun. Maybe you've heard it before. The teacher asks her Sunday school class, uh, boys and girls, why did Jesus call out Lazarus's name? One of the little boys answered, well, so nobody else would come out of their grave. <laughs> Last, yeah, not you. You stay. Lazarus, I want you to come forth. That's the authority of Jesus over death. That's the first thing I want you to see. But I also want you to notice this, and, and we won't notice it in, in the English, but he uses no verbs. Of course, John, when he wrote his gospel, did not write in English. He wrote in first century Greek, and we've translated it so we can understand it into our native and heart language. But as you read it, as John wrote it, it comes across, it's three words, but it comes across this way. Noun, adverb, adverb. There's no verb. So literally, this is what Jesus says, according to John. Lazarus, here, out. The dead man does nothing for his resurrection. Jesus does all the work. Once he is made alive, he responds in faith. And he walks out of the cave alive. And though this is a physical resurrection, I think it's also a glorious picture of salvation. The grave clothes of our sin are wrapped around us in death. We have no life. We are spiritually dead. But then God breaks into our deadness. And he calls us to life. That is salvation. The work of God. We believe and receive him. Have you been made alive by Christ? You received him as your Lord and Savior? This man raises the physically dead to life. This man raises the spiritually dead to life. He is the resurrection and the life. How could he not be the God man? There is no one like Jesus. Do you believe this? Nothing could be more important mm -hmm. for you to believe. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for Jesus, who is our resurrection and life. And those who believe will live again after death and will never, no, never die again. Give us the grace to hear this, the faith to receive it, and the joy to live every day in light of this. Amen.